So Chris said, uh, to start with the problem, um, we've been talking a lot about the unintended consequences of technology, and I actually can't speak to whether or not this is true, but there's certainly a lot of news around the fact that technology is increasing the mental health crisis uh, globally. And whether or not it's being driven by tech, let's assume for the sake of today that it is, uh, we're certainly in a crisis. Over 350 million people worldwide suffer from depression. It has now surpassed HIV, AIDS, malaria, diabetes, and war as the leading cause of disability worldwide. And uh, we have no cures. So I, I want to talk about a possible solution that we have, um, but first, some background, and I mean way back. Okay, so 1763, uh, if anyone knows any of these dates and what happened then, feel free to, to yell it out. But in 1763, um, we discovered willow bark, and not just willow bark, it had been around for a while, but that if you took it and you had, say, a fever or some sort of injury, that it would reduce the symptoms of pain. And that's because willow bark contains salicylic acid, which in the future became aspirin. So what we discovered was the first true medical palliative, which is a drug that uh, suppresses symptoms but doesn't actually treat a disease, so it's not curative and it certainly does not prevent a disease. And when I say we and when I say we discovered, I mean the West, because actually uh, willow bark had been used in this way for thousands of years. So we have a tendency to discover things um, that have been discovered previously, but this is when <laughs> we discovered uh, palliative medications. So not that long after, in 1796, uh, Edward Jenner discovered that you could take small amounts of cowpox um, or uh, exposure to, from smallpox and use it to vaccinate against smallpox. So this was the, our first vaccine. And from this, we discovered not only a vaccine for smallpox, but that it was possible to prevent disease. We really didn't know that beforehand. So this is the discovery of preventatives in medicine. And it was actually many years later that we discovered uh, antibiotics. This is uh, Fleming, and, and you always know it's like an important breakthrough discovery when you have like a black and white picture of a scientist in a lab coat like holding something up that's like really important. Okay, so we discovered antibiotics, and um, these were our, our true cures. And so this is sort of the spectrum of treatment that we have in medicine, right? We have treatments that make you feel better but aren't actually addressing the disease. We have treatments that prevent the disease, and we have treatments that cure disease. And I just want to point out, this is kind of a little bit of a tangent, uh, but in 1921, this is sort of very specific, it's one thing that happened, uh, tuberculosis was killing one in seven people uh, worldwide, and so it was very, very prevalent. We had, this is a sanitarium, and it, it's interesting, so what happened in 1921 is when we created the vaccine for tuberculosis, which I just want to point out, we discovered vaccines in 1796. So this is something like almost 130 years later. And it's always been very interesting to me because we came up with a lot of other vaccines. Why did it take so long for us to address tuberculosis this way? And I think it's because, in part, it wasn't tuberculosis then, it was consumption. So, you know, we talk about technology. Technology is a lot of things. It's not just, right, computers and smartphones. Language is a form of technology. So the words we use when we medicalize something, we tend to treat it as a disease, but we also have these words in, in our sort of culture that mean other things. So consumption at the time was not considered to be a biological disease, unlike all of these other infections. It was considered to be constitutional and uh, desirable. It, theoretically made people um, more artistically brilliant and instilled creative genius. So this is Chopin uh, dying very romantically from consumption. And so it took a really long time for us to treat uh, tuberculosis the way we treated these other diseases. And I point that out because the things we said then about consumption are still the things we say now about, say, depression. <laughs> 
All right, 1945. Um, this might be a familiar date. Uh, World War II ends. So I think this is a really interesting unintended consequence of technology moment. So World War II ends, and we go into Germany, and they have all of these warehouses with technology sort of stockpiled. And among other things, we find just barrel upon barrel of hydrazine, uh, which is rocket fuel. And we're like, OK, great, we can't leave this here. So we import all of these barrels of hydrazine into the US, and we're like, what do we do with this? So we sell it, and by we, I mean the government, sells it very cheaply to pharmaceutical companies and chemical companies to do with what they will. So they take all this hydrazine and they kind of play with the chemical structure, and from that we got a whole line of pesticides, um, we got some antifungals, uh, we got spandex, and any drug that a pharmaceutical company came up with we tested against tuberculosis because, like I said, at the time, one in seven people were dying from it. And this is now 1945, so we do believe in 1945 that tuberculosis is an infectious disease. So we're trying everything to treat it. And one of the drugs that they came up with out of hydrazine was called iproniazid. And so they are giving this drug to all of the patients in the sanitarium, and the patients uh, are elated, right? They end up feeling much better. Um, one report, because they were very florid back in the day with their scientific reports, described the patients as dancing in the halls. And um, this is really interesting because they were actually still dying. So this, this drug was not actually treating tuberculosis, and they weren't getting better. But what it was, uh, was it was the first antidepressant. And at the time, we did not think that you could treat depression with medicine because we didn't think of it the way we thought of other diseases. So it took until 1952 before we discovered palliatives in psychiatry, despite the fact that we had discovered them in 1763. So this brings us to 2014 and my work. So in 2014, uh, we accidentally discovered <laughs> the first drugs <laughs> Uh, that the first drugs that might prevent psychiatric disorders um, in mice so far. And as far as we can tell, they work by enhancing stress resilience. And stress resilience is basically what it sounds like, right? It is the ability to experience stress and recover from it, and so not develop a psychiatric disorder like post-traumatic stress disorder or depression. And for years, we thought of resilience as sort of this passive property, essentially the absence of susceptibility to depression or anxiety. And now we know it's actually an active property of the body, and if it's an active property, theoretically, you can enhance it. So the current treatment paradigm has been you experience stress, uh, you develop one of these disorders, and then we treat you with these symptom suppressors. Again, we do not have cures. And this is obviously relevant in PTSD because stress is, by definition, the main cause. But actually, in about something like 80% of cases of major depressive disorder, the initial trigger is a major life stress. Um, so what we're talking about here is the preventative model where actually you get a treatment beforehand, before you experience stress, and you never develop the disease. So it's not a vaccine, technically, but it is similar to the vaccination strategy. And just to really drive that home, the treatment, uh, the actual medicine is only in the body for a few hours, but the prevention and protection lasts for weeks after. So we've only tested out to a month so far, uh, but it could be that prevention lasts much longer. It could be several months, it could be years. And the same way that when Jenner discovered the smallpox vaccine, it wasn't just the smallpox vaccine, it was the fact that we could vaccinate. This also opens the door for the fact it may not be what the, the compounds we've discovered so far, but someone else can come along and maybe come up with even better interventions that will work for maybe a lifetime the same way vaccines do, at uh, most of them do at the moment. All right, so use cases. There's the obvious one, which is um, military, and um, there are a lot of others that are, you know, firefighters, um, EMTs, first responders, humanitarian aid workers, and then refugees, and a couple of other examples where it's not as obvious. Uh, 
oncology patients. So having a second cancer puts you at something like an 85% risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's these cases of predictable stress exposure where we might be able to intervene beforehand, enhance resilience, and again, that doesn't prevent the experience of stress, it just uh, prevents you from not recovering from it. So again, 2014, psychiatric preventatives. And, you know, this is theoretically, right, it's this great, huge breakthrough. I like to point out the fact that actually, it should have been obvious. This should have been completely obvious from 1796. And it's actually quite interesting that it took us, what, maybe 200 years to figure that out? And why? Well, obviously, because we don't think of depression and a lot of these diseases, or did not think of them as, as medical ailments. And that, again, gets us to this point around language, right, where uh, these are words we use to mean a lot of things, right? We use depression and stress to mean about 14 different things, and I think that also complicates the problem. Um, so... I want to point out, just because we're all here talking about unintended consequences of technology, really interesting thing that to me has been um, a major part of this is that, so one of the technologies that is at play here is intellectual property, right? This is a thing that we of society has created. And in our case, the first drug that we discovered was actually a drug that was already FDA approved. So theoretically, we could have taken that drug, done maybe two or three years of efficacy testing, and it could be out for use in the world. But because you can't protect the intellectual property because of a policy in medicine called off-label prescribing, where a doctor can use any drug for any use, which we don't want to get rid of, you actually can't incentivize the development of generic drugs. And because of redundancy in biology, uh, ironically, the drugs that we have that work for one disease are actually much more likely to work for another disease, right? So um, even the same way that the ipronizid to treat tuberculosis ended up being repurposed as the first antidepressant, the drug we discovered is an old anesthetic that we could theoretically repurpose as a preventative, um, but because of the technology of our legal system, um, we, we can't incentivize it. So we're also working on novel social finance tools to incentivize things, but I think this is a room where um, we really care about not just our local problems in the consequences we're having, but it helps to sort of look globally at the systems that are creating some of those, right? So we can't solve this particular piece of the problem within the framework of science. But if we sort of collaborate with people working in policy spaces or legal space, we can maybe solve the whole systemic problem and then incentivize the whole space. Anyway, um, one other date I want to point out, just because I want to end on a slightly positive note, is uh, 1979. And in 1979, um, and this is, again, maybe about 200 years after the discovery of vaccines, after giving out millions of doses of this vaccine, uh, we declared smallpox eradicated, which is the first and only disease that we as humanity have gone in medically and eradicated from the planet. So um, eradication gets added to our little timeline here, and I don't think we're anywhere near it, uh, but I just want to throw out the possibility that if we really do have preventative interventions for psychiatric disorders, there is a world in which we could eradicate them. And I don't know what that world looks like because I think it would change our culture considerably and maybe have some unintended consequences, um, but it's certainly interesting to envision. Thank you.